We're going to conclude this chapter by looking at the broad range of compounds that one can make using substitution reactions. And the breadth of that is shown with the examples here. Uh, that the, with a, any given substrate represented by this uh, compound with a leaving group on it, you can transform that into just a whole host of other types of organic molecules. Uh, hydroxide ion can displace a leaving group to produce alcohols. Alkoxide ions can dis react in a similar fashion and produce ethers. Sulfur is an excellent nucleophile in the form of a, a mercaptide or a thylate ions and can produce uh, mercaptans or sulfides. Even neutral sulfur compounds, because sulfur is so nucleophilic, can react and you actually form sulfonium ion salts. Nitrogen is a good nucleophile. There are many different forms. There's the amide ion, alkyl amide ions, dialkyl amide ions, and these all produce different types of amines. Even neutral amines, shown here as a trialkyl amine, can react and you can produce ammonium salts. Cyanide is one of the best nucleophiles used in the laboratory and produces organocyanides. Azid uh, is a good nucleophile and makes organoazids. Uh, the halides, particula particularly iodide and bromide, are good nucleophiles. Uh, there are carbon nucleophiles in the form of acetylide ions to produce acetylenes, very important, producing a new carbon-carbon bond. And there are even scenarios where you can use a hydride ion as a nucleophile and transform uh, this into a hydrocarbon. We're going to look at a few of these reactions in a little more detail. The first being the synthesis of sulfides, shown here with the reaction of a thylate ion. It would always be in the form of a salt. There would be some counter ion here as a cation, typically a sodium or potassium or a lithium. And they are excellent nucleophiles. And we'll do substitution reactions by SN2 to produce sulfides. Uh, so the example shown below is the potassium salt uh, of this thylate. Potassium salt of this thylate uh, undergoes uh, an SN2 reaction on an ethyl bromide, uh, and we get a very high yield of this ethyl butyl. Uh, or excuse me, butyl ethyl sulfide. Uh, here we have the sodium salt of thiophenol. Again, sulfur, very good nucleophile. Uh, we end up with this butyl phenyl sulfide. Oxygen does a similar thing. It's not quite as nucleophilic, and it's also complicated by the fact that alkoxide ions are quite basic, as we'll see here in a minute. But you can form salts made from alcohols. Again, the counter ion is usually an alkali metal, uh, but the oxygen anion uh, can do SN2 reactions in the same fashion that we saw with the sulfur. And this reaction dates back uh, to its invention by an English chemist by the name of Williamson, uh, and it's to this day known as the Williamson ether synthesis, so the reaction of an alkyl halide with an alkoxide by SN2. Uh, and so typically the way that these reactions are carried out is by the use of an alkyl halide and an alcohol, and we simply treat the mixture with base. The base deprotonates the alcohol to form the alkoxide ion. So uh, potassium hydroxide, for instance, will deprotonate an alcohol and form the potassium uh, salt of the alcohol, and that's our nucleophile. Other alcohols um, can be transformed into leaving groups in the manner we talked about previously, where we convert them into tosylates, and then you can treat them with alkoxide ions. Here's a potassium salt of an alcohol, and it's the nucleophile that's doing the substitution, and the leaving group is a tosylate. Um, there are a host of ways of deprotonating alcohols. Um, this last example uses sodium hydride, Hydride is a strong base, deprotonates the alcohol to form the sodium th um, alkoxide, and that nucleophile can then displace iodine to make this 
So it has a broad range of application. Its limitation is that it is ultimately an SN2 displacement. And so if you have a hindered substrate, so a tertiary substrate, as we learned previously, they won't undergo Williamson ether synthesis. On the other hand, if the substrate is unhindered, alkoxides can act as good nucleophiles. And so, for instance, if you want to make uh, this tert-butyl methyl ether, then you have to make it using the tert-butyl alkoxide reacting with the methyl iodide because the methyl iodide is unhindered. You can't make it using the other combination of methoxide reacting with the t-butyl iodide because the SN2 reaction won't occur. And also, if you were to think about how does one go about making di butyl ether, it turns out you cannot do that by a Williamson ether synthesis. It will undergo the SN2. As a preview of uh, what's coming down in later chapters, the complicating factor in the Williams, one complicating factor in the Williamson ether synthesis is the strong basicity of um, oxygen anions, of alkoxide ions. And so uh, while they are good nucleophiles and you can get substitution reactions to occur, there is a competing pathway, an elimination reaction that will deprotonate the subject on a position adjacent to the leaving group and result in the formation of a double bond. And these two examples are that. And we'll talk about that more down the road and understand how the, what the mechanism of that reaction is. This Williamson ether synthesis uh, it curiously can be carried out in an intramolecular fashion, and that's shown here. Uh, if you have an alcohol and an alkyl halide in the same molecule, and they can form a reasonably unstrained ring, five, six, seven, or larger ring, um, then that reaction can happen in an intramolecular fashion. So what's happening in this example is that the potassium hydroxide is deprotonating the alcohol converting it into the alkoxide ion. And once converted into the alkoxide ion, you get an intramolecular SN2 reaction to produce the product. Same thing is happening in the other example. Uh, here we have uh, a hydroxyl group uh, separated by four car methylene groups from this chlorine. Deprotonation of the hydroxyl group results in an anion that does the SN2 in an intramolecular sense. And so we end up with four carbons and an oxygen in our ring, and we've synthesized tetrahydrofurane. One curious thing about the Williamson ether synthesis is it does allow for the formation of three-membered rings. And you might not think that that uh, would happen given the strain that's in a three-membered ring, uh, but it turns out that the geometry is such that the reaction can happen readily. Uh, if you take this example at the top, where we have a bromide on one end of this compound, and we have an alcohol on the other end, if you treat that with sodium hydride, You'll deprotonate the alcohol to form the alkoxide ion. And then, curiously, the geometry does allow the geometry allows for that oxygen to kind of bend over and interact with that sigma star orbital and cause substitution to occur, and we get the SN2 reaction, and we form a three-membered ring. So you have to have the right geometry. You'll notice that a particular conformation of a particular stereoisomer is shown here. And likewise, in the example below, you can see that we have the hydroxyl group is anti to the chlorine, or trans, I should say. And when this adopts the right chair conformation, once this is deprotonated, that oxygen, oxygen can bend right over and interact with the sigma star orbital, chlorine leaves, and we end up with a three-membered ring. 
The final reaction we're going to look at more closely is the reaction of substrates with amines of different types. And on this slide, we've got the reaction with methyl iodide of ammonia, methylamine, dimethylamine, and even trimethylamine. Now, this one is kind of complicated in the sense that all of these are very good nucleophiles. All of these amines are very good nucleophiles. So imagine a scenario where you take ammonia and you treat ammonia with an excess of methyl iodide. So you throw in a whole bunch of methyl iodide, more than uh, four or five equivalents of methyl iodide. By equivalents, I mean how many molar equivalents. So if I have a mole of ammonia, I might be throwing in four or five or six moles of methyl iodide. Under those conditions, what would happen? And if we walk her through it, we, we can kind of figure out what the scenario would be. So ammonia is a good nucleophile, and it does the SN2 reaction. The immediate product of that is this ammonium salt. So we've got methyl ammonium iodide. Ammonia is a base, so if any ammonia is present, it will deprotonate this, and we get methylamine. So methylamine is still a Lewis base. It still has a known bonded pair of electrons on nitrogen. Here it is again. It can react with more methyl iodide. Same type of reaction, SN2. It does the substitution. In the same fashion, we would produce a salt. This time it would be dimethyl ammonium iodide. And it could react with any base in here, ammonia or methylamine. Once it's deprotonated, we have dimethylamine. And I think you can see where we're going with this. The dimethylamine is also a Lewis base. It can do an SN2 itself, and we end up with this trimethyl ammonium iodide, which can be deprotonated to produce trimethylamine. And then finally, the curious result is it can happen one more time because trimethylamine still has that non a pair of electrons, can do the SN2 reaction. But at this point, we've reached a dead end. We formed tetramethyl ammonium iodide, and that's a stable salt that can be isolated. So this is a little complicated. What if you want to make one of these intermediate amines? What if you wanted to make dimethylamine? Well, it turns out it's particularly problematic because you end up with mixtures of methylamine, dimethylamine, trimethylamine, maybe even some tetramethyl ammonium iodide. But it turns out the two extremes, the mono substitution and this tetra substitution, are the ones that are easiest to achieve. So you can form very good yields of the tetramethyl ammonium iodide by using excess methyl iodide. So if I start with ammonia and at least one, two, three, four equivalents of methyl iodide, I can get a very high yield of tetramethyl ammonium iodide. The intermediate ones are difficult except for this first one. And you can imagine how to make that work. And the way you make that work is you actually use an excess of ammonia. So let's say I had a mole of methyl iodide. I would add four or five moles of ammonia. And under those conditions, we would form a lot of the methylamine, and then it would stop because we would use up all of the methyl iodide, and it couldn't proceed any further. So here's an example of that, where we take this uh, benzyl bromide. It's a benzyl compound because there's a CH2 group here. and react that with an excess of ammonia, and we only get the single substitution. That finishes off our chapter. Here's the usual list of problems that I recommend that you uh, study in the book and spend time trying to solve.